first of all, thank you to CNEN for the great opportunity to be here with all these amazing people. It's truly an honor. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk to you about how my company, Pyran, is enabling the future of biomass-derived industrial chemicals. Um, before I do a little bit about myself, um, I am originally from Cedar Hill, Texas, just outside of Dallas. Early on, I was interested in things such as saxophone and playing soccer. Um, but then moving on into my career, I went to uh, Texas A&M University for my undergraduate studies, Giga Mags, and then up to the University of Wisconsin for graduate school. Um, there, I co-founded Pyran directly out of my graduate, student, uh, graduate studies with my PhD, George Huber. But more importantly, I met my wife, Marve Ozen, who's an accomplished industrial engineer and consultant and a great business mind. She's actually helped me a lot with my business journey so far. So she gets a lot of credit for everything I'm talking about today. So, um, you know, most of the talks you've heard today are, are more academic focused. So being kind of one of the oddballs in the group, I figured I'd focus a little bit on my path to entrepreneurship. Um, so maybe one would think a typical path to being an entrepreneur would be one, to be a naturally good communicator, two, to have specific goals, to execute decisively, and then of course, naturally you could start your own company. Except the fact that none of those things were actually true for me. Um, I was not a good communicator as a very shy kid. There I am in the background just hanging out. Um, very bad pelvic speaker, um, very nervous, um, and the whole deal. Um, but I did uh, force myself to uh, seek opportunities to public speak. And through many years of forcing myself to do that, I'm now at the point where that's basically my whole job is presenting to investors, networking, and talking to large audiences like you today. Uh, but certainly not a natural gift. Um, two, you, you may think you'd have a specific goal to start a company, but as you can see from this word bank, um, while I had uh, a passion to make a difference, particularly in uh, environmental issues, I didn't know how. But luckily in my undergrad, I did fall into chemical engineering. I must have liked it because I was, the 10 years later, I was still in school um, and it, I think it's worked out pretty well. Um, but certainly not a predetermined fate. Um, and finally, as anyone that went to grad school knows, it's not um, as you would expect. There's trial, error, error, and more trial. Um, lots of ups and downs in the research. Uh, but I do think that perseverance from graduate school is a key factor in, in being an entrepreneur. And I think even graduate students are even predisposed to be able to be entrepreneurs because of what we go through. But fortunately, through my grad school, we did come across this neat technology that I'm going to talk about later on in my talk. But even so, going into my last year in grad school, I didn't even know I wanted to start a company. I took part in an entrepreneurship workshop. And in that workshop, the um, instructor asked the graduate students to raise their hands if they were thinking of starting their own company. When a few of my colleagues raised their hand, I was just in awe that you can start a company directly out of grad school. And I thought to myself, well, what's stopping me from trying? So me and my PhD advisor dove right in. Um, so long story short, this was not a predetermined fate. It was really just an underlying uh, passion to make a difference in environmental issues. And that combined with perseverance and curiosity and a little bit of luck is what led to me starting Pyran today. But enough about me. Um, I want to get more into the more technical portion of my talk. As I mentioned, Pyran's focused on making chemicals from biomass resources. So here's a, a very high level value chain uh, going from the technology side with the biomass or petroleum feedstocks, various conversion technologies to make these monomers, uh, making the monomers into the polymers and then formulating those polymers into the end material such as paints, coatings, plastics, nylons, et cetera. Um, so today I'm gonna kind of talk about how do you implement biomass based technologies and products into the marketplace. Um, so starting on the market side, um, which has been really my focus since I started Pyran. Um, so you can basically think of these monomers as building blocks, as, as toys you can play with to make these polymers. And you can have some green or renewable Legos or building blocks and some petroleum-based building blocks. Um, so one great example of this is this uh, polyethylene terephthalate uh, polymer that you are very familiar with. It's, it's, you know, it's the main component in your water bottles or soda bottles. Um, so if you look at the polymer backbone, you can see that up to 30% of this plant bottle that's marketed is uh, ethylene glycol derived from corn. So, however, the question becomes, how do you create 100% uh, plant-based uh, materials? And one answer is to directly replace, replicate the same petroleum-based material, but from making it from plants. Whereas the other 70% of this molecule of this material right now is made from terephthalic acid from petroleum. 
So this this first method is to make the same exact miracle uh, material, sorry, and that is what my PhD advisor and Pyring co-founder George Hubert does with his previous Nellotech, where they actually make the same exact chemical structure, terephthalic acid, and they incorporate it to make the same exact material. So of course this method is going to be more cost sensitive, um, and, but there's lower market risk because you're making the same exact material. Another way to go about this is to create brand new materials from plants that have, cannot, cannot be made from petroleum. So in this case, I'm showing you this very popular furine dicarboxylic acid molecule, which you can see it's similar to terephthalic acid, but it is different. And it makes a new material. And in this case, they claim it has improved properties. So they, they claim it has improved barrier resistance and lower film thickness, which can, which can reduce the cost of material. So while it's newer, there's more market risk. Um, there's also a lot of possibilities to create brand new materials from plants. Where does my company, Pyrian, fall into this? Well, really both. Um, I'll go a little bit more later in my talk about pentane dial, our product, but as you can see, it goes into a lot of different polymer types. And really, since I started Pyron, this has been my main focus is learning more about these materials. And really, in some of these, we're replicating. We're going directly in uh, with the same properties. And others we're creating. We're creating brand new, improved performances. And it's been really interesting to see the pros and cons of each. There's really not a right answer. Uh, but I just wanted to pose that to the audience today. Um, to finish up my talk, I'm going to talk more on the technology side. Um, how do we create biomass-based technologies as a replacement to petroleum-based technologies to make monomers? <clears throat> so on the previous slide, I showed a lot of bio monomers, a lot of mixture. However, as you're probably familiar, the vast majority of our monomers, our building blocks, are made from petroleum today. Uh, the petrochemical industry has uh, had over 100 years to integrate to lower costs, increase efficiencies, optimize. Um, for example, here's a process flow diagram of an oil refinery, and it just makes you dizzy looking at it. Um, so really, when you think about bringing biochemicals to the marketplace, petroleum has a bit of a head start um, compared to these renewably-based uh, technologies. Um, so even if you make the same exact molecule at the same cost, there's a perceived uh, technology risk for a new technology that you have to overcome. And it is a hurdle, but to overcome that hurdle, you it seems simple, but it's true. You can do one of two things. You could lower the cost or improve the performance, and hopefully both. And luckily, I do think Pyrene can do both of these things. So let's go a little bit more into detail on you know, what makes a biomass technology commercializable. So if you look at a, a, a molecule here, it's a hexane dial, making it from both petroleum and biomass. Um, you can see to make it from petroleum, you're oxidizing an inherently reduced, almost by definition, feedstock um, to this oxygenated intermediate. As, however, sometimes th that includes many steps which can be very difficult and costly from petroleum. So as an alternative, what you can do is you could selectively reduce the inherently oxygenated biomass feedstocks. And these are the exact pathways, in fact, to make this molecule from both resources. Which one you prefer will depend a bit on the technology and the economics, but those are both options, and, and biomass is, is improved in some cases. So as an example, let's take these, these molecules, alpha omega diols, with alpha mean, mean, meaning beginning, omega meaning end. You have these um, alcohol groups on the beginning and end of these aliphatic carbon chains. And if you look at the four, five, and six carbon diols, you can see that there's actually a, a, a gap in the five carbon, one, five pentane diol. There's a much lower volume. Um, because, and that's because crude oil is inherently more abundant in even four and six carbon platform molecules. And there's a dearth of five carbon platform molecules. So this is an example where there's a gap in the petrochemical space that potentially biomass can fill. And as you may know, uh, biomass is abundant in those same five carbon platform molecules that is lacking in petroleum. So that was the focus of my PhD research was to make this 1,5-pentane dial molecule from biomass. Um, there was a previous route to make 1,5-pentane dial using this ring opening approach. Um, it was really neat catalysis, very interesting chemistry. However, it was simply uneconomical and not a commercializable process. So during my PhD research, we found this new path to make this molecule that can spontaneously ring open without any catalyst. And from there, you can use a much cheaper catalyst with much higher rates. And what that does is, of course, a more economical process. And as a side note, this is the only slide in my whole presentation that is on my PhD research. Um, it's a little sad how quickly those slides are disappearing. Hopefully, a year from now, I still remember what I did in my PhD. Anyways, moving on. Um, so now we have this economical process. Um, here's the process flow diagram. You turn that with our collaborators into a full economic uh, techno-economic model. 
And then from there, you spit out your pricing data, your minimum selling prices, your capital costs. And because my, the focus of my PhD was the catalyst, I like to brag about the fact that this route has over 50 times lower catalyst costs than the previous routes to make this molecule from biomass. So this is a great example of, of integrating the fundamentals of catalysis of chemistry with the forward-looking economics and technology. And what you have when you combine both those things is a commercializable technology, and that's really where Pyran came out of. So if there's one big takeaway I'd like to leave you with today, it's perhaps that in some cases, the inherent chemical functionalities of biomass derived molecules can actually be advantaged to lower costs and improve performance of biochemicals compared to petroleum-based chemicals. And I think pyrene is an example of that. Um, so that's all I have for you today. Um, there's too many people to thank along my journey from undergraduate to grad school to Pyran, but um, I'd like to thank them all. I wouldn't be here without them. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kevin. Um, I have a question. Do you envision making 1,5-PDO uh, on a large scale using continuous flow? That's right, exactly. Continuous flow is something we focus a lot on in the laboratory from my PhD advisor, George Huber, uh, because it is more implemented commercially. And so that is what we're planning to do. Do you have any um, applications that you imagine this will go into uh, first, the 1.5 PDO? Yeah, as I showed, there's quite a few applications. It's really a, a workhorse monomer that can be used in a variety of different things. but. There's things such a, as uh, coil coating, so metal coatings, um, polyurethanes for wood flooring, UV curable coatings for fingernail polish and dentistry fillings, um, so and synthetic leather. So I know I'm just naming a whole bunch of seemingly different things, but the commonality between those is the polymer backbone is similar in those each of those applications. Um, someone asked if you could talk about one or two key things you would tell us you'd do differently um, from your experience starting Pyran. Yeah, I mean, differently compared to uh, PhD, it's um, the similarity is that both require uh, you to wear a million different hats at once and to work really hard learning constantly. So that's where I actually think it was a simple transition. But of course, it's very different as far as what you're actually doing. There's a lot of business things. Um, and technology scale up is a whole nother beast. Um, it's one thing to have a catalyst that works in the lab. It's a whole nother to make sure you have the right reactors, the right process conditions, and something that you could actually build a, a full commercial plant into. So it's a, it's a lot of new challenges. There's also another question. Is there a standard quality of 1.5 PDO that your customers want? And uh, if not, how do you decide on your quality? That's a great question. Anytime you're making a chemical that's going to go Polymer's quality is a big factor. Um, you can put random numbers on it. Typically, polymers, you want to be 97, 98, 99% pure. But really what it comes down to is the feedback from the customers, from the ones making the, the end product, the paint, the coating, because um, they're the ones that are going to tell you if any impurities in your, your um, product will have an effect on the end material properties. And that's a very important uh, consideration for biomass derived molecules to make sure those impurities don't affect the end polymer. All right. I want to thank you, Kevin. That was a great talk. Thank you.